Well, when you see these symbols here, uh, what does it do for you? What does it do to you? I, ho I hope there's at least some sense in you that you would run from this rather than to it, right? Like some people go, oh, radioactive material, let me go check it out, you know, or uh, biological hazard. Uh, yeah, something cool in that red bag, um, you know, something like that. Some people would do that. But at least for me, if I saw the skull and crossbones, I might say, you know what? I'll pass. Um, no, no thanks um, on that. And and those uh, there, just if you're doing the quiz, it's radio from left to right. It's radioactive. It's biohazard. It's po poison. Those are the, the little symbols there. So if you see that on something, again, I hope you wouldn't necessarily run to it um, and say uh, how interesting this would be. But instead, you'd say, hey, this is toxic waste, man. This is hazardous material. I should probably take some degree of caution. See, and, and these are just some basic thoughts, I suppose, on the physical level. If, if you think about these things, I would like to try to produce as little bit of this as possible, right? I mean, like whatever this is, I don't want my life to be known as, you know, here comes Scott, put a biohazard on him. You know, this, this guy is just like hazardous material or, or toxic every time he's around, um, you know, that sort of thing. You're just a poisonous person, just a sour, terrible situation, you know? Uh, and, and so when you think about that, that would be the first one. I would like to produce as little of, as possible, but I would also like to participate in as little of it as possible. Uh, that if I, if I saw a red bag uh, marked biohazard, I would walk the other way. I'd just kind of walk around it. You know, I wouldn't say, hey, I wonder what's in there, a grab bag, you know. And, and if I had to deal with it, if it was my role to deal with it, if it was my responsibility to deal with it, for the sake of everyone involved, I would handle it. But I would handle it carefully because it's a serious matter. And it's, you know, to handle it uh, improperly is not only a danger to me, but it's a danger to everyone. And so that's why I titled today Toxic Waste. And God designed the human body with a way to purge out the poisons, right, that come our way to take out toxins, right? And there's certain levels of things that we can tolerate and we can take, and we're, we're able to do that. You know, our immune system, our, our, our system gets rid of things as, as, you know, this is not good. We're not keeping this. We're not storing this. And as long as it's in, you know, small doors, doses and we're healthy, everything's fine. It can be dealt with. But there can come a point in a person's life where the toxic waste would overwhelm the system and bring disease and death. And the unhealthy thing actually wins out over the healthy thing. And a person can have a healthy heart, a sound mind, other organs working perfectly well. But if the kidneys fail, if the colon fails, if the liver malfunctions, if these systems that are built in to get rid of and filter out and, and deal with these poisons and these toxins, if they weaken, well, the person themselves will die. It happened, almost happened, to a good friend, the die part, uh, this, of mine this year. A guy that I've known for many years, a very strong guy, a uh, very physical guy. He's, uh, you know, been a kickboxer. He's all this thing. His name's Bill DeAra. And uh, he's, he's actually a guy that I, I got to see recently. But, but he lived through an event. Um, he got an infection, and his system ended up going septic. You know, he's kind of a tough-it-out kind of guy, and he was toughing it out, but it, then he wasn't toughing it out. And they rushed him actually to the hospital. And the doctor said, you came within inches of death. You almost didn't make it. This was extremely touch and go. We almost didn't get ahead of the things that were going wrong with your body. The system was shutting down. And, and soberly, one of the guys who on his same floor was admitted at the same basic time for a, a similar problem didn't exit the hospital alive. He didn't make it. A guy that came in at the same time and he said, the doctors were dealing with both of us and he didn't make it and I did. Same, same basic age. And I think about that. I'm like, man, this is, it, even now, he's still trying to get out of the hole uh, in his health that was dug through this situation. What was the problem? Again, toxic waste. It just somehow the system was not purging the poison. And what's true of a human body, if it's true of a person physically, then it's also true of us spiritually and emotionally. And I think that's something God always gives us physical examples to learn from in our life. And we have to know how to handle toxic waste in our life. We have to know how to do that. There's people and places and patterns that don't lead to health. They don't lead to good life. 
They're toxic waste. And why do we need this teaching? Well, uh, you know, I, I like to start out with this thought, this slide here. Contract, contrary to comic book theology, dumping, or, you know, jumping into a vat of toxic waste does not give you superpowers, right? This is the way it all starts in almost all of these things. You know, the Hulk or whatever, it's gamma rays and all these things. And, and some toxic situation happens and out the other side comes a person who's faster and stronger and smarter and better and just has all the powers we wish we had. And we go, well, wait a minute. Is that really the way it is in life? Are you suddenly superhero material because you were exposed to toxicity? See, when you think about it, we need to know how to handle toxic situations, toxic relationships with groups or individuals. Dare I say it, maybe friends, maybe family, things like that. Why? Well, here's the simple reason. Because it's toxic, right? And I was like, duh. Okay, so it's deadly. It's not going to lead to life of that relationship or that group or that individual or anything else. So it has to be dealt with. It's not unloving to deal with these situations. It's loving to deal with them. Because toxic situations kill joy. They kill life. They kill our capacity to have a positive influence on others, to have the kind of overflow in our own life, you know, of good things coming out of our life in such a way that if somebody is just, you know, wasting all of our energy and wasting time and all these things, it zaps our capacity to really face things with fervor and faith. And the reason I say this is, again, this was the church in Corinth. This was what was happening with them. They were in danger of a complete system shutdown. I mean, they were a, a very vital organ there in Corinth because they were an outpost of health of people who were spreading the love and joy and peace and mercy and grace of God into people's lives and they were just a tiny little outpost of that and then it became an outhouse sort of and you go ooh gross you know that's that something happened it's a little shift but it's a big difference see in the name of grace they just let the place get overrun with toxic waste they failed to take away the toxins. They failed to have the difficult talks about toxins and about those things. See, and again, when you think about that, if someone becomes reluctant for any reason, because it's not always comfortable, to purge the poison, well, they'll learn their lesson one way or another. They'll find that you can't just run from the biohazard bag and say, well, I'm not going to deal with that. No, you've got to contain it <laughs> if you can. You've got to stop it being produced if you can and sometimes you have to shoot it out into space or whatever it is we do with stuff now you know the aliens are going to come get us for that they really are and so um let's look at um first corinthians 5 <laughs> verse 1 this is what he says it's actually reported that there's sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality that it's not even named among the gentiles a man has his father's wife. Now, again, you know, at least this, this uh, teaching should probably come with a parental advisory on some point. It's at least PG-13. But, but this is an extreme case here to make a point, right? I, I'm, I'm putting it here. This is probably, hopefully, not something that specifically you go, man, I need to know what to do in this case. Hopefully, you never have to know what to do in this case because this is a really whacked out reality show situation, right? I mean, this is uh, an extreme case. And you can say, well, it doesn't apply to me. I'll just keep reading. But this is why I want to apply this to us today, because it applies even though this general or this specific situation may not describe a situation you're in. Boy, the general principle definitely describes things we will always be in and dealing with, which is this. Here's the, the, the wording here <laughs> was that a man was in a sexual relationship with his stepmom, with his father's wife. I mean, talk about a, a dysfunctional situation and publicly flaunted. OK, this was a consensual situation. Make, the, make that very clear. This was people involved, adults making adult decisions. And he says that's poison. That's messed up. Now, there's a lot of variations around this thing that also you would say very different things about. But in this case, these people had no one to blame. They were making a choice that they had control over and they had no boundary whatsoever. 
So here's the general principle, okay, if you're ready for it. It's this, a healthy blank, I feel like I, I'm on one of those uh, talk shows, you know, with Richard Dawson or whatever. And a healthy blank must have some process to purge poisons. Top five answers are on the board. Well, top five answers are this, you know, a healthy individual, a healthy family, a healthy marriage, a healthy friendship, a healthy, you know, fill in the blank, organization, church, uh, company, uh, neighborhood, nation, I mean, you know, keep going. World must have some process to, poise, to purge poisons, right? And so there have to be boundaries somewhere. There have to be healthy boundaries. And again, what was the issue? Well, he says, the stuff going on there, even the Gentiles. Now, that was just a way of saying people who don't have a, a religious background or a religious sensibility or sensitivity, they don't even you know, think of God much necessarily, but they're like, ew, that's bad. I mean, even the Gentiles wouldn't do that. They're like, that's gross. And here it is in the church and everyone's going, that's good because everything's good because we don't talk about toxins. We don't talk about bad stuff. We don't ever really mention anything that makes anybody uncomfortable. And, you know, yeah, that's kind of, that's, but love is love, and there you go, and everything's cool. You know, and the, the Gentiles are like, well, I don't know about that. See, the Gentiles were talking about the toxicity of the Corinth church. Think about that for a second, that the world was looking at it and going, that's weird, man, that's messed up. And see, I've seen things in churches that I'm like, I don't think the world would put up with that. And I, you may remember that I said correction goes in both directions. God is using a situation here where he's saying to unbelievers, know a little bit more about this than the believers. Hello. And so when you think about that, in a town like Corinth, where everything goes, the heathen said, that doesn't go. Well, that's just plain creepy. That's just messed up. And you think about this, it's a case of willful, toxic relationship. And you know what? At some point, that's somebody's right. You want to do it wrong? Do it right. You can do it right. That's your right. Do whatever you want. But don't do it here. And don't do it in a way that is harming all the people around you. This is what you see. See, this is the point that you'll see so much in this. There were poisoned people. These were po poisoned people. And I'm really slow, very slow, to call a person poison, right? I'll call a behavior poison. I'll say, listen, that attitude, that's like biohazard. You know, that, that way that you talk to people, that way that you treat people, that is, that's just messed up. That's radioactive, man. But every once in a while, if somebody just persists in these things, it's not an accident. It's not a whoops. It's who they are. It's how they are. And you're like, I think this person, it's not just a practice that's toxic. It's not just a principle that's top uh, or a place. It's a person. This person is toxic. And they were making a choice to poison the place that was a place of grace. And they weren't seeking help. They didn't want help, but they didn't care that they were hurting people. And you think about this, this is what this passage tells us. What should the people in that community do? Well, they should purge the poison. Now, again, you could look at this and say, oh man, is this gonna go to one of those religious ethnic cleansing kind of things? No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, let's, let's use the metaphor again. In my life, if I have toxic attitudes and actions and I don't deal with them, they will deal with me. You know, they just do. And I need to, have a way, I'm a community of one as a start, right? I always look at the concentric circles of my life. I go, first of all, I gotta do what I say and say what I do. So if I'm gonna do this, I gotta do this in my own life and purge the toxins emotionally and spiritually and even physically out of my life, okay? But then I go, okay, my, my next closest relationship, that's my marriage, man. I can't have a toxic marriage. I can't have toxic talks with my wife. Now, we may talk about difficult things. This doesn't mean that we don't talk on challenging subjects that need to change. But if, if, if a pattern that we're in is wrong, we got to fix it. We're a community of two, and we got to fix it. And I can't be looking at other people to fix it for me. I, I got to fix it. I'm an adult. Fix it. And then... I, I keep 
spreading that out and start saying, okay, what other communities are am I uh, involved in? I gotta have a way to purge the poison. I'm not talking about purging everyone who isn't perfect, or you'd be alone. The great glass house purge of Davidson, you know? Well, there would be nobody left. I mean, people are messed up, okay? Are you messed up? Will you admit it? I'm messed up. I've messed up and I am messed up. But a public, persistent, unrepentant, willfully selfish, self-absorbed person who doesn't care who they destroy, I'm sorry, that person is poison. And that person needs to be dealt with like a hazardous material, like a biohazard bag. Contain it, <laughs> and if it's got to go, it's got to go. Now, again, you see him saying in verse 2, if you're puffed up, if you're puffed up, you should have mourned that he who had done this deed might be taken away from among you. Verse 2. I mean, he's basically saying, you know what? They, they don't have a place in your place. What was happening in, in Corinth, again, was suffering. They were suffering from a life-threatening case of overgrace, as I call it, overgrace, which is the Bible says that God gives grace to the humble and he opposes the proud. What does that mean? If somebody's like just prideful, self-absorbed, narcissistic, destructive soul, then you go, I, I can't give grace to that. I can't give place to that. I can't say, well, let's, let's put them in a position of power and give them a greater audience. Let's give them a bigger platform to ruin everybody's life. No, that's over grace. That's, that's something that doesn't even have anything to do with what the Bible teaches. They were mixed up about what love meant. They thought love meant, well, anything goes. You know, something that being a loving person means I got to accept everything that comes my way without confrontation, without evaluation, without saying that will not fly in my house. I'm sorry, you can't do that to me. I'm sorry, that, that will not continue. It cannot continue. We don't do that here. It's not the way we talk to each other in our house. And so when you think about that, if we're loving, we're accepting, we're tolerant, we're non-judgmental, all those things, everything is okay. The problem is if there's a sickness of sin, what do we do? We just, just, kind of, just sweep it under the rug. But the problem is the biohazard is now under the rug, right? It is, it's not labeled, it's not dealt with, it's nothing. It's just still there and more dangerous than ever. See, because when you think about it, labeling it, can be important. You know, I know we try to avoid it. I try to avoid it. Labeling kids. This kid's a bad kid. This kid's a good kid. Well, listen, uh, I will definitely label a behavior. That's an unacceptable way of dealing with that situation. And you know what? If this person persists in the unacceptable ways and practices, at some point, I have to equate the person with the practice and say, I'm sorry, you are unacceptable <laughs> because that is unacceptable. And you're wanting me to allow that to continue. So this is what I wrote down again. Don't waste, you know, toxic waste. Don't waste your life with the toxic. Don't surround yourself with people who are like this. People, are, you know, you, you don't want to be around them. And, and the hard part is, if it's you, oh no, what if it's me? What if I'm toxic? What if people say, oh no, when I'm coming? Well, if enough people do it, you start realizing, I, I need to change. And that's part of what the passage is all about, is change. It's not just about the hopeless case of, well, that's a toc toxic person. Oh, well, you know, jettison them. There's a reason. There's an understanding behind it. There's a difference between the common cold and tuberculosis. See, because the common cold is, hey, we all have it. You know, but tuberculosis, we don't all want it. Do you understand? I mean, there's a point where somebody's behavior has gone beyond the boundary. And I'm annoying. I've been annoying to my wife for 28 years, right? And that's probably not going to change. There's some things about me that are just plain old annoying. But I hope that I'm not toxic to my wife. What would it be to be toxic to her? Her life's worse because of me rather than better. Her, on, the, on the average, I make good days bad and bad days worse. I mean, if that's true, man... <laughs> I need to get away from me or she needs to get away from me because that's just not right. See, don't waste your life with the toxic. If the toxic person refuses to change at some point, you change from that. You get out of their present. This was an extreme case again, but it made a point. 
And I'm not talking, and and this is why we got to apply it to ourselves, not necessarily talking about some crazy, slimy sex story. Maybe it's a person who's just a habitual liar. Man, you're around a friend. I'm sorry. I've been friends with this person my whole life, but they've been a liar their whole life, and they just lie, 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 lie. And, you know, they're sorry they lied, but they're not sorry they're lying because they're lying when they say they're sorry because they're not changing and they don't care to. And an unmerciful, critical, soul such, such, you know, soul-crushing bummer of a person isn't somebody that we have a biblical obligation to be besties with. We don't. We, we have no responsibility to do that. Um, you don't know why, <laughs> maybe, but certain people, certain things, certain practices, certain interactions, they just drain you of everything good in your life. And you're like, I, I don't know. So I'll look at things and go, I don't know about the label. Sometimes it's easy to see the biohazard or poison or whatever. But you know what? There's certain things that it's just every interaction I have with certain people, and it's a very small number of people in my life, but every certain times come along and I'm just like, I don't know what it is, but this person, when I walk away from an interaction with them, I feel worse about me, worse about the world, worse about everything. And I just, I, every hope that I had was dashed in that three minutes. And I'm like, what should I do? Press into this situation, spend more time with them, talk through it over and over. No, not what's suggested here. This is what it says. I wrote it down this way. What's allowed will continue. <laughs> you know, what's allowed will continue. If I let somebody wipe my feet, wipe their feet all over me as a doormat, they found a doormat. Everyone needs a doormat. Thank you, Scott, for being that in my life. Well, I'm sorry. Find another doormat. See, again, the Bible does teach to turn the other cheek. But I have two cheeks here, anyway. So I, I can turn... Two ways, you know, but at some point I run out of cheeks and, I, and, and the Bible does not suggest, again, that people chase down the toxic situations in life and, and, and just, you know, mire ourselves deep in those because that doesn't really give us the capacity to be the light in the world that we were meant to be because it's so draining of our light, we have no light left. And so when you think about this, this is what was happening in Corinth. I indeed, he says, verse 3, as absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged as though I was present him who's done this deed. He says, I, I wasn't there, but I, if I was there, I'd say the same thing I'm saying now. He says, verse 4, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, he says it twice, Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. What's he saying there? He's saying in the words of Dwight, shun them. Um, Dwight Schrute from The Office, one of the great theologians of our day. Um, he, he, he has this thing where they, he does shun and he just, they're not going to talk to you. And then if he needs to talk to you for something at work, he'll go unshun. He will unshun you for just a moment, get the information he needs, and then reshun. And uh, it's, it's just one of my most beautiful things. We do it sometimes at the house. Shun, unshun. Okay, I will listen to this, but what is he saying here? Let the devil be his only friend. If this guy, if this guy wants to do the devil's deeds, let them hang out. If you, if you want to be a destructive, uh, horrible, you know, self-absorbed person, I know another destructive, self-absorbed person. He came to steal, kill, and destroy. He's called the devil. And guess what? I think you guys will really hit it off. I think you guys are great friends. You seem to be in the same business. Why don't you go talk some toxic stuff? Because that's not what I'm into. That's not what I'm about. And this is what he's saying. Cut them off from healthy relationships. And let them just sit there in their radioactive waste if they want to. If they want to waste away in their life in the radioactive waste, let them do it. And I think about this and you go, well, that, man, that's tough. But notice this. The point of the purging is twofold. It's protection and correction. It's protection. It's protection of the healthy. See, that, that was the problem. Corinth, it was catching. As people were like going, well, I don't know. It seems kind of messed up that a... The guys are like with his stepmom and the dad, and I don't know, this seems kind of whack. But I guess this is what it's all about, you know, just whatever is whatever. 
that, that wasn't healthy for them. That wasn't leading to healthy things in that situation. Even the heathens were looking on saying, that's not right, man. And again, when, I, when, I, when even a person who has a different moral standard knows it's wrong, you know what? People who are not Christian still know certain things are wrong. It is wrong for a powerful person to take advantage of a powerless person. It's wrong. You know, it's wrong for someone to judge somebody for a characteristic they can't change and didn't choose. It's wrong. Racism is wrong. It's not wrong because it's Christian. It's wrong because it's wrong. Right? Uh, th when you think about these things, you make, a, make a list. Sexism is wrong. It's wrong because Jesus never modeled it. But it's just wrong. You don't have to be a believer to know that. But you know what's weird? Is when the church is more messed up in some of those areas than the world, and the world is leading the way. You go, why do they have more light than us in this area? I'll tell you a reason. Because we allow toxic stuff because we're nice. We don't talk about toxic stuff because we're nice people. We would never want to hurt somebody. You know what? Hurt somebody if that par person is hurting somebody. I, wait, I had a situation. These are real life situations from my life. I had a guy when I was at, at the church in Miami, it was a fairly large situation there, and we had lots of kids and other things, and I'd come across all kinds of people. And there was a guy who, who kind of had some behavioral problems, and he was a he was an adult, you know, and he came, and I ended up talking to him. I said, "Hey, tell me your story, man. What's up? What what are you here for? What what's up?" And he said, uh, "Well, I'm here because, um, well, actually, I like to hurt kids." And I said, "Oh, really? You like to hurt kids? So you're? I, we noticed you're doing some weird stuff, man. You're doing some weird stuff. Um, see, I have a problem, and so do you, which is that we have a lot of guys here on our staff." who like to hurt kids, I mean, who like to hurt guys, who like to hurt kids. So you are not safe here. I said, you're welcome in our office if you want help. You are never welcome on our campus ever again. In fact, if we see you anywhere in town within 10 feet of a kid, we, all of us are, we got cops on the staff. We have taken your picture. We have your number, buddy. You want help? We'll get it for you. You want to keep hurting someone? Oh, I got guys who will make sure you get hurt. Now, again, am I advocating violence? Maybe. In that case. But, but I'm just saying something pretty strong. If you don't know how to purge a poison, if you're, oh, well, you know, this is just a grace place, you know. Uh, just, you know, you're working through some of your issues. We're all got issues. Listen, that, no. No way. I would not be a pastor. I would not be a parent. I would not be an adult. I would not be a person with a, a moral compass if I could have a guy say that to me and say, oh, you know. To each their own or something. No way. This is what he's saying. There's a protection, but there's a correction too. There's change for the unhealthy. He said, you want to you have unhealthy behavior? Well, if you don't want to change, then you can go sit with four other people who are just as messed up as you are, and we will lock the door, and you can talk about your toxic thoughts, and you can keep them there in that dungeon where they belong. And you can, you know, because God will give grace to the humble but he hadn't given grace to those who don't want the help. Important things to notice in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, he says. The name is the nature of Jesus. Well, it's the nature of Jesus. You've heard it here so many times. Probably tired of it, but it's our name, Glass House. Why? We don't throw stones at people. I'm not, I, I, without sin, cast the first stone. I'm not here to judge and criticize people unnecessarily, but I will judge certain things and say, you know what? That's wrong. Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn, but to save. But he did condemn certain things and say, I'm sorry, that won't fly. That's not God's spirit. He says, when you're gathered together, this is not personal vendetta. This is not toxic talks behind everyone's back and that kind of stuff. This is not sin sniffing witch hunts. Of, uh, excuse me, I'm sure there's somebody here who's bad and doing something bad. This is him saying, look, when there's a situation that everybody doesn't even need to be told about because they can see it and have experienced it for themselves. He says, deliver that one to Satan. And the irony is, I, you've seen it, I've seen it. It's one of the things that bothers me the most about the world, and that's saying something because there's many things that bother me. But have you ever noticed how drunk drivers are always the single and sole survivor of every drunk driving accident? 
you're just like, you know, 14 innocent people were killed in this situation, and you're like, except the one person who caused all of the pain. And when you think about that, again, there's someone who's an enabler in so many situations, and this is why I say someone who helps people hurt people, what's allowed will continue. That's why I say it as loud as I can. <laughs> it shouldn't be allowed. If I'm allowing something, I can't control the world, but I can control aspects of my world, and I can say, in my realm, no. In my friendship circle, nope. That's not how we treat each other, and that's not what we do. In my personal relationships with friends, nope. And one of the worst things that we can do is try to eliminate the suffering that goes with sin that God built into sin, See, if we have toxic waste dumps and we become that for somebody and we just let them toxic waste dump all of their stuff on us and their radioactivity and everything else, and you say, well, just, I'll just absorb all that. Well, you will absorb all that. And if we help them out and we bail them out over and over again, then in some ways we're helping it happen. And this is what he's saying. Prodigal son. You know that story? I love that story. There's so much in that story. But one of the things is it says, no one gave him anything. He ran out of resources. He was, you want a situation where a guy delivered over to Satan? That's basically it. Oh, okay, here. You want to live in the pig pen with the pigs and eat pig slop? I'm not going to join you for dinner. Um, you do what you do. Find a pig pen and go to it. And it says nobody sent him a monthly check to kind of hold him up during this time. It says nobody helped him at all. All the friends ran out, friends that he had that were toxic also. And he came to his senses. The Bible said at that moment he went, I had it better in my father's house than I have it here. See, the prodigal son had to hit the bottom before he could get back toward the top. And this is really important because this is what Paul is pointing to. Verse 6, the glorying is not good. Don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Um, he's talking about a lump of dough there. But um, where, your life is a lump. This is what he's saying. You're a lump. Um, and you go, amen, I, I hear you. I am a lump. But leaven is yeast, right? And what he's saying is it doesn't take much of that yeast to get a situation where it, it puffs the whole thing up. It puffs it up with what? pride and there he says you got to purge out the old leaven verse 7 you may be a new lump so that's my goal for this year for me i want to be a new lump um, since you truly are unleavened for indeed christ our passover was sacrificed for us i love paul because he's always pulling these old testament pictures that if we get them we get them you know and verse 8 he says therefore let us keep the feast he's talking about the feast the the happy times he says not with old leaven the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with leaven of bread of sincerity and truth. I mean, think about this for a moment. If somebody said, hey, we're having a party, what's the theme, malice and wickedness? You go, oh, I'm in. Um, or they go, here's, here's, the, uh, here's the theme, sincerity and truth. Now again, you know, sometimes some revelry can sound fun, but you know what, at the end of it, I love being around sincere people. <laughs> I love being around people that when you, it doesn't mean they're not, not fun or they're not funny. I mean, I'm talking, but they're just, what you see is what you get. You don't have to ask, I wonder what they meant by that. Or, oh, wow, here's a, here's a backhanded compliment with a nice little jab in the back of it. And you go, what? Why? Why has it got to be that way? Why has it always got to be that way? He says, truth. I'd rather, tell me the truth, man. And he says this, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep people company with sexually immoral people. Again, this is the specific he's talking about. But he's talking about a general principle too. He says, yet I certainly didn't mean, this is so important, please dial in. He says, yet I certainly didn't mean with the sexually immoral people of the world or with the covenant, covetous or extortioners or idolaters because then you'd have to get out of the world. He was saying... <laughs> I, I'm not telling you that you need to be a sin sniffer out there going, wait, 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 wait. Person who doesn't claim to follow Christ, here's all the stuff messed up in your life, and I am here to tell you all the things. He's saying, look, <laughs> you won't have any trouble finding toxic waste in the world. The whole point was I was trying to place a grace place of people 
who say, I want toxicity out of my life. I want the things out of my life that destroy peace and joy and, 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 and truth and sincerity. I want those things out. I want real friendships. I want real connections. I want real relationships with people. And I want to have fun and I want to have an abundant life and all that stuff. And that's supposed to be contagious. He's saying, I'm not telling you don't be in the world. I'm telling you be in the world, but don't be worse than the world. <laughs> or what's the world going to look at and say, well, I think I'll go to church because they're worse than we are. Uh, they're bigger liars than we are. You know, they're bigger cheats and, and bums than we do. They're, they're more covetous and extorting and idolatrous than we are. You go, well, that's messed up. So I wrote it down this way. <laughs> it's very simple. I like words like this. Avoid. Avoid. Um, if somebody's a void, what is a void? They're just empty. But, but nature abhors a vacuum, right? So you know vacuums. What happens to vacuum? They suck up all the dirt. I mean, they're just, you know, the, the, it's like a black hole. It takes all the light. It takes all the matter. And, and have you ever met somebody who you go, that's my nickname for him now, the, the void. Yeah, that person, when I'm with them, it's like a void. There's just nothing positive, everything negative. And if I have anything positive, it goes, where did it go? I don't know. Does it ever affect their behavior? No. Um, so what do I do with a void? It's built into the word. Avoid, avoid. This is what he tells you. Don't do this. It's not a call to isolationism. It's not a call to separatism and legalism and all that because Jesus ate with sinners so much so that they all said, this guy's like a glutton and a drunk or something. He's hanging out with the gluttons and the drunks. Yeah, he's probably soliciting a prostitute. And he's like, yeah, he was. He was soliciting, soliciting her with, there's a better life for you. You, can, you don't need toxic relationships where somebody pays you cash you, you, you want reality. And God, it, when you know that God loves you, you don't have to sell yourself cheap for that. And you know what? In so many cases, those are a whole other issue, but human trafficking is so heavy on my heart and is so much in, we're even, uh, um, we're getting opportunity to, to help with that directly, with somebody who's helping with that directly. So anyway, I say all that to say, there's toxicity out there, but there can't be toxicity in here. Where are people going to go if the refuge has more refuse than the re than that world? What, what do you do when the lifeboat has more holes in it than the Titanic? What do you do? And this is all he's saying. He's not talking about avoiding people. He's talking about avoiding voids because there's nothing there. There's no light there. There's no light for anyone there. And there's a special poison of people who pretend to be super spiritual and they are actually the super slimy ones. And you've seen that. We've seen it. I don't ever want to see it in my own life and hopefully never in any of you. But I think about it this way. The worst poison, I think, that Jesus always talked about was leaven, 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 leaven. And you know what he, it was? It was hypocrisy. And you know who did it? The religious people. It wasn't. I don't even know if it's possible for a heathen to be a hypocrite. Like they, they told their parents they were going to the bar and they actually went to the library. I mean, what? What would a heathen hypocrite do? They, they told you they were lying to you, but they actually told you the truth? I mean, what, what would it mean? And so hypocrisy is reserved for people who say they're really spiritual, but they're, they're worse than other people. See, that's a mislabel. Instead of poison, it says yummy, healthy, holy, righteous, really good person. I'm really good. I'm godly. And then and they just run you down, tear you down. I have seen people destroyed more sometimes by somebody who, well, brother, let me tell you what I think of blah, 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 blah. And you're like, wow, man, no medicine there. God looks at it and labels that, too, and says, leaven, deadly biohazard, man. Get it out. Get it out. Get it out of my house. Think about what God was doing. The feasts, leaven free. Why was he doing that? God's so smart. Man, he's smart. He puts these pictures in it. And the, the unleavened bread and the getting leaven out is part of the Jewish Passover, if you've been around that. They're getting the, they're getting the toxic thing out of the house so that we can have joy in the house. We can have a, a celebration of life. The angel of death has passed over 
get the angel of death out of our community. We don't want it, man. And so he says, you're not to go out of the world. You're to go into the world. But you've got to have a, a, an awareness of toxic and what to do about it. So we're almost done here, but I just want to think on this, you know. To be in the world and, and on it. A boat was built to be on the water, but not under the water, right? Um, and I, I'll never forget, Lynn's dad had a, a really cool Donzi uh, speedboat. It was really nice at one point in life. And there's only one problem with it. One little tiny thing failed to work, the bilge pump. Anyone know what a bilge pump is? Well, bilge pump is the thing that keeps the water in the water rather than the water in the boat, right? So one day went out and there's the boat at the bottom of the lake, the bottom of the lake, just on the dock. Hey, where's the boat? Oh, there it is. And what was it? Didn't perch the problem. Didn't perch the problem. Didn't pump out that. Again, was it built to be the water in the water? Yes, it was. We're not supposed to dry dock our life and go, that's it, I'm staying away from all the evil influences. He's saying, no, you're supposed to be an, a, 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 an influence for good out among the world, but you won't have the energy and capacity to do it if someone's robbing every bit of energy you have by being their personal waste dump. Verse 11, now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral, immoral or covetous, Greedy, materialistic, you know, those are the words there. An idolater, a reviler, that's a character assassin. Somebody who just, you know, hey, um, I wanted to talk with you about so-and-so. So you want to talk about them, but you don't want to talk to them. He says, a drunkard, an extortioner. Don't even eat with such a person. So this is what I wrote down. Again, thank you, Dwight Schrute. Never feel guilty about shunning a toxic person or principle or place. Again, I'm not talking even about people all the time. You know what it is? It's shunning a thing in my life where I go, you know what, this, this attitude, it's, man, it's poison to my family. It's just poison. I, I'm going to purge it. <laughs> I'm not even going to eat with it. I'm, I, no, I, it's got to go. I got, whatever I got to do to get this out. It's radioactive to our relationship. My peace of mind is all in pieces after this. And so I, I just look at it and go, you know what? I, Whatever that metaphor means for you, you know, again, a hospital analogy. Um, hospitals got sick people and everybody's sick on some level. But the doctors and the nurses and the crew can't be sick and they can't be casually handling sharps and biohazards and fluids and everything. And you're like, you walk into the hospital and you're like, wow, this, this is wow radioactive don't worry come on in you know and stuff like that you go like i don't want to be around this place and that's what he's saying you either get away from that place or get that person out of that place but you're not going to abide in a sick situation somebody who just affects and inf and, and, and affects and infects everyone around i'm sorry that's not welcome any man or a sick person <laughs> is is welcome in a hospital but the hospital itself cannot be overrun with a bacteria and a breeding ground for that, can it? And that's what he's saying here. A society can't do that. Verse 12, what do I have with judging those who are outside? Don't you judge those who are inside? Now, those who are outside, God will judge them. Therefore, put away from yourself this evil person. Notice it doesn't say kill them, just shoot them. Um, you know, witch on them, boil them in oil. He just says, just, just avoid them, get them away, get them out. Um, and this is an interesting thing because it suggests that your presence or my presence ought to be taking that away ought to be a punishment. I mean, I think about this again. There's certain people in my life who they said, that's it. This is the last you'll ever see me. And I go, oh, <laughs> cry me a river. Oh, thank you, God. <laughs> thank you, God. No, but, but you know what? There's certain people that if they said, you know what? I can't keep hanging out with you because you just... Uh, you're just you're just hurting me every time. I'd be like, oh my gosh, how about it? That's that's terrible. I mean, that would be awful if suddenly you guys decided that I was poisoned to this place and you guys wanted to keep meeting, but I couldn't come here. It would destroy me because I go like, but this is just the best thing in my life. These are the best things in my life, and this is what he was saying, and that's why I wrote it down. Takers will take everything from you. Except correction. Ever met a taker? Just take, 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 take. And you go, well, could you take a little counsel? No, I don't take counsel. Um, I do whatever, but I'll take your joy and I'll take your energy and I'll take from you all day long, but I will never take advice. 
See, if something's the wrong thing, it's wrong. Treat it like the wrong it is. Avoid, avoid, purge it, send them packing. And if they won't pack, pack yourself and head on out. That's the way I look at my life. Again, do I keep my vows? You know, I, I have the highest regard for those things. But I also have the highest regard for these things. That we're talking to a person who's not just mildly annoying. We're talking about somebody who's toxic whose situation is so out of bounds that they don't respect anyone's boundary, including your own. And when you confront, this is just a little tip as we head on out. If you confront somebody on an area where they are hurting you and they don't respond to that positively and they don't deal with that on some level, you should take very serious note of it because you've just found out how much they value you versus them. Because you know what? You just said, when you do this, it hurts me. And they go, well, I don't really care. I'm going to keep doing that anyway. And see, when you think about that, I have a responsibility. to. I can't change the whole world, but I, I, can, I, I have a world. And, and I invite, I've learned this over, over time in my life. I decide who's close. I do. I decide who's close to that. People who care, people who have integrity, come on in. Yes, absolutely, inner circle, whatever that's worth. <laughs> You're in the inner circle. <laughs> but you know what? People who damage and drain and destroy the people I love and the things I love and the things I believe in and that stuff, I go, you know what? I'm just not pressing into that person. I'm not <laughs> like, I just, wow, I, more of that. And I think of it like a stadium example. You know what? Um, the people who are in the courtside seats in your life, if I can make it as personal as I can, don't give those courtside seats to anybody, to everybody. Oh, yeah, you know, you, you want to yell and scream and, you know, heckle me from the front row. I do have a ticket for you. It's in the parking lot. Um, you can pick it up there and stay out there. Or if you like, um, you know, you could be in the nosebleed section where I can't hear you and all of you and your little haters can hate away up there. Um, I got a game to play. See, now think about this. Uh, you know, what's allowed will continue, and we have to, we have to take these things seriously. And uh, just one, one closing illustration that I had, um, there was a case where there was a lady, uh, you know, we've had some very interesting cases over the years, but there was a lady, again, she had uh, mental illness, and I, and I know that, and we identified it as it was, and we tried to get her help as much as we could and everything, but she was coming in and out of the the fellowship that we were a part of there and she was very disruptive she was very destructive uh with things and i had to at one point confront her and just say listen you won't take your meds you won't take your advice you won't take the counsel you won't take anything but so i am going to give you um a, an option which is now you're going to go um you're not you're not welcome here as long as this is persisting if this is the way you're going to act and this is the way you're going to be and she said she told a bunch of people pastor scott kicked me out of the church and i actually talked to her and said remember let's change it just a little bit you kicked you out of the church right you kicked you out of the church your behavior kicked you out of the church. We welcomed you in time and time and time again. We, we did as much as we could possibly do. And we were working harder on you than you were working on you. And I'm sorry, that's toxic. It had to go. And she did actually, sadly, I mean, I can't make this stuff up. She did end up um, murdering her own mother in her own home and uh, is doing jail time today. So I look at those things and I go, you know, what, what do we do with situations like that? Well, do I hate this lady? No, I still think about her. And I think of all the pain that was put into her life to even end up where she was. But at the same point, point, I can't just perpetuate the cycle and say, oh, someone hurt you? Well, then I guess you can hurt people. That's okay. Uh, we'll, we'll just let that slide. It, it can't slide. You got to take out the toxin lest it take you out and everyone around you. And so I think about this. These are the times we see it done in the New Testament. Final thought. Flagrant, unrepentant, perverted behavior. 1 Corinthians 5. False doctrine. People who come in and tell people things that aren't true. Who, who just destroy people's faith with things. And, you know, they, he said, just get them out. You, do, you don't need a bunch of liars in the church telling all kinds of nonsense. Divisive people. He says, people who mainly you look behind them and it's all wreckage. 
I don't know what it is, but every time that person has any contact with anyone, it's never good. It never comes out positively. It's always negative. It's just bad. And then the final one is freeloaders. That's Second Thessalonians. He says, you know what? If there's people there to take, 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 and never give, the whole idea is that you would be a giving group, not a taking group. And that means there's some things we just won't take. <laughs> and so there's the goal of gain. And I think about that again. Think of it on your personal life. If there's things that you've got to purge, you got to purge those poisons, man. If there's things that are not leading to healthy attitudes and actions in your life, take them seriously. You know, um, the purpose is not uh, just to, to purge the poison. You're a poison person. But it's, it's life. It's that we would have that vibrancy. Are there attitudes and actions that are zapping your spiritual strength? Are the people around you? Uh, are there connections to people that need to be strengthened? You know, great, healthy relationships. And you say, man, I should, I should invest more in that because that actually, every time I'm around that person, I grow. I, I, I go forward. I'm doing so much more. I, I want to be that. And I want, I want to be around people like that. Are there poison people that at the end of the day, you say, we tried, we tried again, but maybe you and I need to admit we shouldn't uh, try not to love each other because uh, you remember how that never worked. I mean, it's like poison situations that I, I just need to weaken that or avoid that void man I, I, I'm sorry maybe it's me maybe I just don't have what it takes uh, but I just like I, I you know I, I need to be able to have health in my own life so that I can have it to the people God has called me to do and so that's what I would send you guys on with I hope um, I hope it's helpful this is not um, to me uh, a toxic place you're not toxic people I'd love to be around you all the time um, but Got to go eventually.